There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. My grandmother lived a life devoted to Jesus, and today her talks have been made available in their original form. So you too can be built up through the insights and mysteries God revealed to her throughout her ministry. Now, without further ado, here is Elizabeth Elliot. Lars and I certainly want to say thank you to all of you who have been so warm in your kind remarks and appreciation. And for us, it's just a great pleasure and a privilege. And we always feel as though we are the major beneficiaries of this kind of a weekend. So we are very grateful for the chance to be here. My husband asked me to tell you that he had taken some orders for discipline, the glad surrender, and he found some more copies. So those of you who did order them, if you would like to pick up your copies instead of waiting for him to mail them, he'd be glad to see you at the book table. And he also asked me to say this. I hope I can quote you accurately, darling. Um, I aim for clarity, but sometimes I get confused. Was that it? Close enough, huh? <laughs> I said to him one time, as he was trying to explain something with great difficulty, um, it's clarity we aim for. And he said, yeah, but it's stupidity we got. <laughs> well, we've talked about waiting on God under the headings of trust, relinquishment, doing the next thing, and this morning, peace. How many of you have read Pilgrim's Progress? Wow, I'm amazed. Did you read the whole thing, or is it some abridged comic book version or something? <laughs> You remember that when Pilgrim arrived at the House Beautiful, Prudence and Charity received him, gave him supper, and they talked about the Lord of the Hill, who had slain him which had the power of death, but not without great danger to himself, which made me love him the more, said one of them. He did it with the loss of much blood, but that which put the glory of grace into all he did was that he did it out of pure love. He is such a lover of poor pilgrims that the like is not to be found from the east to the west. He had stripped himself of his glory that he might do this for the poor. And they heard him say that he would not dwell in the mountain of Zion alone, and that he had made many pilgrims princes, though by nature they were beggars. And they gave themselves to their Lord for protection and took themselves to rest. The pilgrim they laid in a large upper chamber whose windows opened to the sun rising. The name of the chamber was Peace, where he slept till break of day. When I was writing my biography of Amy Carmichael, A Chance to Die, my husband and I spent nine days in Donavour, the mission which Amy Carmichael established. And we stayed in a beautiful little guest bungalow. And there was a beautifully lettered wooden sign over the door that said the name of the chamber was Peace. And it was a, pa a place of, of great peace. Amy Carmichael's room was called the Room of Peace. That's the way everyone referred to it. They use that room today. They haven't put a velvet rope across the door and preserved it in exactly the same state it was in when she left. But uh, they do have her books and her desk, and they allowed me to sit there at her desk, surrounded by her favorite books, and that was just an overwhelming experience. But everybody talks about the Room of Peace. Where is such and such? Well, it's in the Room of Peace. That's Amy Carmichael's room. I wonder how much peace you have in your life. I would hope that this weekend the measure of peace will have been increased by our learning a little bit more about what it means to wait on God. 
I just asked our beautiful pianist if she would if she knew the hymn if thou but suffer God to guide thee and I wish I had thought far enough in advance to ask that this be a copy of this be given to everyone because the words are so beautiful and I've been reading to you from the hymn be still my soul the hymn if thou but suffer God to guide thee has this in the second stanza obey thou restless heart be still and wait in cheerful hope, content to do whate'er his blessed will, his all-consuming love hath sent. God never yet forsook in need the soul that trusted him indeed. At least one person down here that knows all those words, too. So if you have an old hymn book, not one of these new ones that has mutilated all the hymns, I was just appalled to see how badly they've ruined it in the hymn book that's over there on the piano, but... If you can find an old one, you may find that hymn, hymn in there, and it is, it's one of my favorites. If thou but suffer God to guide thee. Now, our, we've talked about our waiting on God, which is a quiet holding of ourselves in readiness. And I would hope that it would be out of pure love as we heard in this little section from Pilgrim's Progress. He did it with the loss of much blood, but that which put the glory of grace into all he did was that he did it out of pure love. What Christ did for us was out of pure love. What we do for him is meant to be out of love. Of course, our love is not yet pure, but we pray constantly that the Lord will purify and sanctify us and burn out the dross, the dross. And if he must do that, it will be painful, won't it? The trial of your faith is much more precious than gold, which perishes. And gold, in order to be refined, has to be put through the fire. Same thing is true of us. And I do hope that none of us will leave this cove without a fresh understanding of the Lord of the Hill, as he was called in this section of Pilgrim's Progress, who is such a lover of poor pilgrims and who paid such a price of self-stripping. And he asks us to follow him, to live in company with him. Can we for a moment imagine that such following and such living will not entail self-stripping? Of course it will. And when the opportunity comes, may we be given grace to recognize that that's what it is. One of the prayers of Amy Carmichael that she put into poetry form was, And shall I pray thee change thy will, my Father, until it be according unto mine? But no, Lord, no, that never shall be. Rather, I pray thee, blend my human will with thine. I pray thee, hush the hurrying, eager longing. I pray thee, soothe the pangs of keen desire. See in my quiet places wishes thronging. Forget, forbid them, Lord, purge, though they be with fire. And work in me to will and do thy pleasure till all within me peaceful reconciled, tarry content, my well-beloved's leisure. At last, at last, even as a weaned child, the weaned child is finally calmed instead of fussing at regular intervals for the mother's breast. So we've been talking about the various aspects of waiting on God a quiet holding of ourselves in readiness to do whatever he wants. It involves silence, no fussing, no questions, just silence. We are to be on the tiptoe of attention, utterly at rest in conviction that he, our master, doeth all things well. Do you believe that? Can you wait? on him for the unfolding of that perfect will. One of the wooden mottos, carved wooden mottos in Amy Carmichael's bedroom was good, acceptable, and perfect. 
And of course, that comes from Romans 12. We learn as we present our bodies as a living sacrifice that the will of God is good, acceptable, and perfect. And that room, the room of peace, is the place where she suffered for 20 years, bedridden most of that time. She almost never left that room for 20 years. She was injured when she was 63 years old, and she died at 83. The room of peace. So that is our waiting on God. And I have a letter here from a young woman who obviously had not learned very much about this. I get a lot of letters that reveal how desperate the need is for this understanding that all we need to do, the answer to all of our problems, if we would just realize that the cross is the cross, the gospel is the gospel. We don't have to have special interest groups. We don't have to have a special message for this or that. So often after I've poured out my soul on this subject for a weekend, somebody will come up and say, but what would you say to a person who has such and such a problem? All I can say is exactly what I've been saying. Now this dear sweet girl, she says, I seem to have a problem relating to men. I seem to have a problem keeping their attention. They never ask me out twice. I have always been dumped. By now I'm quite frustrated and I have been since high school. This frustration I have lived with seems forever. The problem is I want a relationship so bad, she puts that in capitals, it seems to consume my every waking moment. I feel God is keeping this from me on purpose. Well, she certainly is right about that. <laughs> and I blame him and get angry with him. Well, this is about a 10-page letter, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. She says, I have this overwhelming desire to belong to someone. Don't ask me why I felt ashamed in the first place. Why won't God let someone into my life? I feel so ashamed that no one has ever wanted to be with me. I feel left out, abandoned. No one can help me understand. When will it be my turn? Is it just a pipe dream? I'm afraid that I will be the one and only person. I'm afraid if and when I do get married, it will be the one and only person I've ever dated. Wouldn't that be a disaster? <laughs> can you imagine? You know, I prayed from the time I was about 16 that the Lord would never let me fall in love with anybody I wasn't going to marry. And God answered that prayer. Imagine being afraid that the one she marries would be the only one she ever dated. I feel deprived. I cannot... can't read the writing now. Oh, I do feel like there's a, it's a carrot being dangled in my face and someone saying, look at that beautiful carrot. Sorry, you can't have it. I just want it to be God's will now. I feel like my life is on stop. This can't be what my life is going to be like from now on. But what if it is? If God has someone for me, he will bring him in his own perfect timing. I wish my desires would correspond with God's. But I want to be pure and true, and I suppose God is trying to make me so. I think she supposes correctly there. Why is there such a contradiction there? It's like there are two people living inside me. I sit alone on a hill that none would climb, nor could I descend. I am separated from life, life as I would like it. From whence comes the hill, and why must I sit in torture and dismay as I watch my dreams played out before me, etc. She waxes quite poetic toward the end of the letter. And of course, I have to write a brief answer to these 25-page letters that I get, and I'm sure that most of the recipients would say, well, Elizabeth Elliot, she doesn't understand. She's just given me the back of her hand. I don't really mean to do that, you know. I would like to help people. But I don't know what to tell them except to come to the cross. That is where he gave us rest from our sorrows and life from our deaths. Waiting on God is what this poor, dear, sweet girl needs to learn. Now, having given you the definition of waiting on God as a quiet holding of ourselves, silence, no fussing, being utterly at rest in the conviction that he does all things well, there is another aspect to it, which is suffering. Waiting is 
often a form of suffering. But I would like to give Romans 8, 17 to those who perhaps have not thought about this aspect of suffering. If we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if, indeed, we share his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. Again and again in scripture, we find that there is a link between suffering and glory. I remember finding in Jim Elliot's journal after he died, alongside the scripture reference, if you suffer with me, you will also reign with me, or if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. He had written, I shall not reign, I have not suffered. And it was true in a measure, it was almost entirely true so far as I know, that he really had not known any real suffering. But I know that he did just before he died. There was a long period of suffering during which the Alcas were trying to get those men dead, as they told me. It took them a while. But there's this link between suffering and glory. We will reign with him if we suffer with him. And if we share in his sufferings, we may also share in his glory. So supposing that God's apportioned suffering for you right now happens to be this agony of waiting. And it can be a real agony. Got my notes turned upside down here. The self-restraint is painful for us, isn't it? The restraint of a horse, they tell me, is painful to begin with. The horse has to get used to that bit in his mouth. I don't know how he ever gets used to it. And the reins and just uh, being held in when this tremendous energy is coiled up there. And a lot of us are like horses champing at the bit. Certainly this dear girl who wrote me this letter is an example. And when Jim Elliott first confessed his love to me, he said... Uh, we were sitting on the grass in a park, and he had told me that he loved me, and then he told me that he thought maybe God was asking him to remain single, perhaps for the rest of his life, which was a little bit more stunning announcement even than the first. <laughs> and uh, we sat down on the grass, and we talked for about seven hours. This was on a beautiful Memorial Day morning. And I remember his looking me straight in the eyes. We were sitting opposite each other. I obeyed what my mother told me, keep them at arm's length <laughs> and never chase boys. Well, I had always obeyed both of those. So on this occasion, we were sitting facing each other and he said, you know, I have the body of a man and you have the body of a woman and I want you. But he said, I'm not going to lay a finger on you. He said, I'm not even going to ask you to wait for me. I'm certainly not asking you to marry me because he said, God might want me to remain single for the rest of my life. Now, all of this is told in the story in the book Passion and Purity in much more intimate detail. But it was anguish, the anguish of unfulfilled longing for five years from that day forward. The patience of unanswered prayer, which brings to mind another hymn, Spirit of God descend upon my heart. There's that phrase in there, teach me the patience of unanswered prayer. Our eyes fail with looking upward, said the psalmist. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land. As the heart pants for the water brooks, so panteth my soul or longeth my soul after thee, O Lord. Psalm 119.20, he says, my soul breaketh. These are very accurate descriptions of how we feel, aren't they? That's one reason I love the Psalms, because it's the book in the Bible that describes feelings more than any other. Every feeling you and I have ever experienced, I think you're going to find in the Psalms. So waiting is a form of suffering, and we have to recognize that God allows that suffering in order to refine us. 
to this woman who wrote me this letter and to all singles, I would say, if you saw yourself as alone with God, answerable only to him, not to parents, not to friends, not to society, or even to your own cherished notion of what's best, if you were waiting only on him and not on a man or a woman, would it not be easier to accept today's gift of aloneness? Nothing to care for but his willing or not willing, and nothing to desire except his desire. Can we possibly reach that point here on Earth? Well, perhaps not perfectly, but it's certainly something to which we can aim, as that poem of Amy Carmichael's expresses. Shall I pray thee change my will, thy will, my Father? until it be according unto mine. No, I pray thee rather blend my human will with thine. I want to learn to will what God wills. And as he changes my desires, then the word of the psalmist can come true. Delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. It's as we learn to delight ourselves in the Lord we need to remember on whom it is we wait. We said we talked about that in the first hour. He is our strength, and to wait on him is to receive strength. References for that, Isaiah 40, 31, and Psalm 27, 14. He is our joy, hence we receive our happiness through him, Isaiah 30, 18. And he is our portion. Lamentations 3, 24 to 26. He is our strength. He is our joy. He is our portion. Now this amazing chapter of Romans 8 is just, it's just so loaded with profound spiritual truths that I'm sure that if we read it every day for the rest of our lives, we would hardly scratch the surface of, of all that is in here. But this concept of sharing in his sufferings is a very seldom understood idea, but it is expressed many times in the New Testament that we actually share in Christ's sufferings. Now, how in the world am I going to tell this girl who writes me this letter that she can share in Christ's sufferings? What has that got to do with Christ's sufferings? Most Christians that I talk to tell me that they think that means uh, the kind of thing that Paul himself was experiencing. He was Im literally imprisoned because of his testimony for Jesus Christ. So since hardly anybody in our country suffers in that way, does this mean that you and I are all eliminated from the priceless privilege of sharing in Christ's sufferings? I don't believe we are. God does not give very many of us heroic things to do. We are not given huge sufferings such as so many in other parts of the world are given. Our country has been virtually exempt from all of that. We don't have the slightest idea what real suffering is as a nation. Deprivation and persecution and imprisonment and torture and things like that. We know nothing about it. So what does that make us? Are we in a very elite, separate class that doesn't have to suffer at all? Or are our little sufferings so minuscule by comparison with, for example, Viktor Frankl's in concentration camp? Are they meaningless? No. Paul says in Philippians 1, 24, unto you that believe, Unto you it is given also to suffer. Unto, it is given not only to believe, but also to suffer. It is given not only to believe, but also to suffer. So suffering is a gift given by God for the privilege of sharing in his sufferings. Because remember, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. And if your grief is waiting on God or waiting for God to do something in your life, if this is the form of suffering that God has given to you, 
presented to you, as it were, on a platter and said, here, will you accept this little portion for today for my glory? Then what can we do but receive it with thanksgiving and offer it back with thanksgiving? It is my offering. It is my sacrifice of praise. The psalmist says, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits? Now get this, he's asking, what can I give God for all the blessings he's given me? And the answer that he gives is, I will take the cup of salvation. Now if in the cup that God holds to your lips, there is the bitterness of suffering, you can take it in thanksgiving for all his benefits. Now this is way more than we can cover in this morning. My two books, Loneliness and A Path Through Suffering, do deal in greater length with this. But as I was thinking of waiting on God and the route to peace, this chapter, Romans 8, just spoke to me. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God. Our sufferings are not worthy to be compared. And Paul's sufferings were pretty great, weren't they? Compared to ours. Not worth comparing. Not worth the snap of your finger by comparison. And in that other passage where he speaks of the same contrast, 2 uh, Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, he talks about the weight of glory as though we put all of our sufferings on one side of the old-fashioned kind of scales, you know, where you have an arm with two pans suspended, and on one, in one pan you put everything you've ever suffered in your whole life, all the worst things that anybody's ever done to you, and all the physical pain and the mental pain, the emotional pain, everything else, stick it on that one pan, and then put on the other side what Paul calls a weight of glory. And our sufferings are going to look like feathers. They will just soar to the top. Feathers by comparison, not worth mentioning even by comparison with the glory that will be revealed in us. This is all related to our waiting on God. Wait in trust, in silence, in love with that Yes, Lord, on your lips. Take up your cross. Yes, Lord. Follow me. I will, Lord. Anything you say, anything you want to give me, I am here to be your servant, your waiter. Well, so much for our waiting. Now I want us to think about an aspect that perhaps some of you haven't thought about. The creation waits. All creation waits. Verse 19, the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Do you ever think about that when you look at a sunset? You ever think about that when you look at your dog? I used to think about it when I had my precious little Macduff, a little black Scottish terrier. He would look up at me with those black beady eyes and his little pointy ears and his square beard, and I would think, here is a creature designed by God, loved by God, made by God, given to me. I'm sure that that little dog was assigned to me for the portion of time that I enjoyed having him until he died of cancer. And he reminded me every day that he was a creature who did exactly what God made him to do. Sometimes I thought he was rather naughty, But he did exactly what Scottish Terriers were designed to do. And when I saw that face, I thought of the imagination of the creator who could come up with the face of a lizard and the face of a camel and the face of a Scottish Terrier and your face. (laughs) What an imagination. And as I had to watch that little dog suffer to the point where we finally put him down, I thought, how creation groans. And he doesn't know about the hope 
that's given to all creation, don't ever tell me that God doesn't have anything else in mind for Macduff. Because the Bible clearly says, everything that hath breath shall praise the Lord. All creation is waiting. Now, Macduff did not know he was waiting for the revelation of the adoption of the sons of God. I don't think he did. Maybe he did. I mean, how do we know? Whenever I look at an animal, I, I think about that. What do we really know about what those animals know? When we were in Kenya, I had the opportunity to practically look up the trunk of an elephant. Just amazed to think of this huge, silent, plodding, slow-moving, majestic creature designed by the same one who loves me. But the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. Liberated from its bondage to decay. Think about that and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Macduff has decayed long since. Creation will be liberated. Verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And if there's one thing that brings tears to my eyes almost more easily than human suffering for some reason, it's the suffering of animals because they are innocent. They didn't do anything bad. They didn't do anything wrong. Somebody just told me, I can't remember if it was here or at the conference on Wednesday, that I guess she said the Serbs have cut off one leg of each of the Lipizzaner stallions. We all say, oh, you know, we can hardly stand something like that. I looked out of my window one morning, and there was a seagull sitting on our front deck. Well, we, we see many seagulls flying over, but they never sit on the deck. They never come that, they, they never come that close to the house unless there's a very big wind, and they get blown in, inland. And this particular one, as I looked at him from a distance, I thought there's something very strange about that seagull's head. I wonder what's wrong with him. And as I got closer, I realized that he had one of those plastic tops of a six-pack stuck in his beak and around the back of his head. So there was no way he could get his beak closed, which meant that he was obviously starving, going to starve to death. And he was sitting with his head tilted, looking at me. And I thought, is it possible that this creature knows that I could help him and that he's come for me to help him? So very, very cautiously and slowly, I opened the door and I tiptoed toward him and he didn't move. He just kept looking at me with that fierce, bright eye with his head tilted like that. And as I reached for him, he flew. And I thought, he will starve to death. Creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, says Paul, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And any of you who are as old as I am, which will be 65 next month, 66 next month, um, when you look in the mirror, you know that this body is going to need some very fancy overhauling redemption, the redemption of our bodies. So all of creation groans. Here is the suffering of anticipation, the agony of unfulfilled longing. What does it mean? What has it got to do with waiting on God? We are one with creation. We wait, creation waits, everything God made waits. I suppose the morning stars who sang together are waiting. I don't know what happens when stars explode and new stars appear and all of these incredible things that I read about astronomers discovering. 
the black holes and the black dwarfs and the quasars. I, I'm, I, my imagination just goes bananas trying to think of how God ever came up with all these ideas. But isn't it amazing? Isn't it wonderful to think that it's not just we human beings, but all creation is waiting for that incredible moment when everything that hath breath is going to pr praise the Lord. The seagull, the stallions, the woodchuck that I saw dragging himself across a highway because his hind end had obviously been hit by a car and he was desperately trying to pull himself with his front legs. Think of all the cab horses back before the days of the automobile that dropped dead in their harnesses because they were so overworked. Taxi cabs were horse-drawn, you know. It will be liberated. They will be liberated. All creation groans and waits for that moment. And then the third aspect of waiting. Have you thought about the fact that Jesus Christ waits for us? An old hymn by Ter Stegen says, He and I, in that bright glory, one sweet joy will share. Mine to be forever with him. His that I am there. Can you stand it? His joy that I will be there. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he, has al what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Christ's longing for those he loves. And I don't know of a more poignant chapter than John 13, where it says that Jesus, now having loved his own who were in the world, now showed them the full extent of his love. Now, wouldn't you think that because he was on his way to the cross, that that would be an adequate demonstration of the full extent of his love, the cross? But what did he do to show his disciples, these poor, failing, fallible men that had walked with him and talked with him and been taught by him so intimately for three years and hadn't done very well? Their record is not a shining one. Now he was going to show them in this intimate context of the Last Supper the full extent of his love. And what did he do? Got down on his knees and washed their feet. He knew that he had come from God and was going to God. In other words, his deep consciousness of his origin and his destiny gave him the strength, gave him the serenity, the peace to do the dirty job, the lowest job that a slave in an Eastern household ever did, which was to get down on his knees and wash the feet of those disciples. Remember, he washed the feet of Judas, who was on his way to betray him, and he washed the feet of Peter, who would fail him so sadly. And you remember what Peter said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus said, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And then Simon Peter, in his impulsiveness, he really does go overboard, doesn't he? He said, okay, Lord, then not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. <laughs> and then when he had finished, he put on his clothes and returned to his place, and he said, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. 
Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master. We are his servants, his waiters. Are we willing to do whatever is analogous to washing somebody's feet? The humblest job for which there will be the least thanks. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You will be happy if you do them. These things, incredible, imagine. And you know, Jesus was able to move to the next thing. One of the most incredible proofs of his serenity, this serenity that came out of the knowledge of where he came from and where he was going, was the fact that he could sit down and eat with his disciples when he was on the way to the cross. Have you ever lost your appetite because you were suffering? Of course. We find it impossible to live a normal life. We can't do the next thing. We can't continue without missing a step. He never missed a step. He had set his face toward Jerusalem, and as the psalmist, uh, as the prophet tells us in Isaiah 50, verse 7, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. And so he had the serenity to wash the disciples' feet, to pass the bowl to them, to dip with them into that same bowl and to speak to them of his love. No collapsing, no self-pity, no fear of anticipation of the suffering that was about to come to him. He was waiting there, wasn't he? He knew what was coming. He knew exactly what was going to happen that Judas would betray him, that he would be captured and bound and slapped and tortured and whipped and put on a cross. He has shown us the calm confidence that comes when you trust the Father, the peace, his meekness, that wonderful Meekness, not weakness. Don't ever confuse meekness with weakness. It doesn't mean phlegmatic. It doesn't mean passive. It doesn't mean laid back. It means receptive. It means teachable. And he was receiving with both hands all that the Father had to send to him. And no servant, he said, is greater than his master. Let's never forget that. Yesterday, somebody said to me, if you would give one word to a prospective missionary, what would it be? That was the word. Don't ever forget, no servant is greater than his master. Nothing will ever happen to you that hasn't happened to your master. And then he says, you must love each other as I have loved you. Love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. And love is the intention of well-wishing and of unity. That's what love is. You can put that down in your notes. You can get a whole seminar on the subject of marriage out of those few words. Love is the intention of well-wishing and of unity. And that's what he wanted his disciples to learn. Love as I have loved you. Jesus Christ waits for that day when we will have been fully obedient. He looks on us with longing love, with the anguish of waiting for the fulfillment which the redemption of his sons will bring forth. He asks us to wait with him and to wait in trust so that he can be working in us so that here on earth, here in North Carolina, here wherever we live, that God will be ma manifest in our mortal bodies. And then his joy will be fulfilled. His longing, the reason why he went to the cross. He waits to see this accomplished. 
and he has shown us how to do it. How do we do it? We serve one another. We humble ourselves. We forgive. We wish well to all others. We wish for unity. We aim at unity, whatever that may cost. And then, in the end of that 14th chapter, the chapter that follows the one about the Last Supper, such a beautiful one, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Then he says, he's going to give us one final parting gift. All this, he says, I have spoken to you while still with you, but the counselor of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And this final gift, peace, I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Now, where did that peace come from? What kind of peace is it that Jesus Christ offers to you and me that is so different from anything that the world can give? What kind of peace does the world have? Only the kind that depends on circumstances. You find yourself sitting, at a, watching a sunset over a calm lake, and you feel peaceful. But that's not the kind of peace that Jesus is talking about. His peace was a strange one, wasn't it? An unknown form of peace that came out of unremitting toil and effort, seldom with a seen result, subject to constant interruptions, unexpected demands, short sleep at night, little comfort, sometimes scant food, beset with disappointments and usually misunderstood. Yet peace all the same, undeviating, filled with joy and gratitude and love. That's what God wants to give to you and me. Will we wait for that peace? Do we realize that we have the same origin and the same destiny that Jesus had, knowing that we come from God and are going back to God? What is there to fear? What job could we ever say is beneath us? Nothing matters. Absolutely nothing matters except Jesus Christ. That Christ, Paul said, may be manifest in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, life is Christ, and to die is gain. May God give us the peace that comes from waiting on God. And I would like to read, in closing, the last stanza of Be Still, My Soul. The hour is hastening on when we shall be forever with the Lord. When disappointment, grief, and fear are gone, sorrow forgot, love's purest joys restored, be still, my soul, when change and tears are past, all safe and blessed, we shall meet at last. God bless you. I pray you've been encouraged and inspired by what you've heard today and will keep joining us here and on social media for my granny's inspiration. Until then, remember, the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms.